Greetings and salutations, you lovely individuals. Welcome back to another FPL League Unlocked. Eric and Mark here with you as we approach, I'm going to call it finals weekend, even though we got to wait an extra week uh, for LPL. We're going to final the big match preview, the big matchups from the LCK and LEC. But first, we had that winner's final, and the challenge fails yet again for the LPL in terms of not having a banger series, BLG versus TES, the two top-rated seeds in the LPL playoffs, absolutely delivered on the rift. They just can't help themselves, man. They just no. know that we want to get this Silver Scrapes five-game bonanza out there from the LPL. And yes, winner's bracket final, they absolutely delivered on that five-game bonanza banger that you want to have. This one had it all. It had your bottom lane duos popping off all the way through. It's got a little bit of spice and some picks, and it absolutely has got some mind-blowing plays that will have you jumping out of your seat. Anytime you're ending a series in a game five with the TF in your base back door and kind of a last second auto attack, yes, we're, we're gonna give it a certified uh, banger status. And listen, this TP out of TES, it's got to be less than one second away from finishing before he finishes off that Nexus turn. Oh my god, it is so close to being that uh, appearance and then just boom. Well, that, uh, that Nexus is not going to be the one going down. If that finishes, TES, we're kind of in the driver's seat in terms of the fight around uh, the dragon. So who knows how that game five plays out if that TP is one second away or one second closer to finishing it's 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 so close this is normally one of those times where you talk about game fives where one team separates from the other in the series they just have you know whatever it is it's the draft the focus the the you know uh, energy to stay focused in throughout the series all the way through these five games that wasn't the case in this series it was both of them locked in in this game five especially your boy bin in the top side for blg we got to give him the shout out here because you know what we're not really giving him a shout out in any of the other four games in this series because it was all about the game five performance from him on that twisted fate that's where he really stepped up for the team yeah he was finding picks all over the map with that tf ult he obviously got just a absolutely disgusting individual matchup lead over 369's Cassante, which of course is more, uh, more likely than not when you have that ranged matchup, but he really snowballed this one out of control. And of course, got to highlight Mr. MVP Knight on the Talia. Some of these flash shoves that we got to see, especially that one on Jackie Love around the mid lane. The confidence this dude plays with is unmatched. I've never seen a Talia played like that. The way that Knight was taking control of the champion and taking control of this game and the destiny for BLG and making sure that they continue this path towards that LPL finals, that they're going to be that final boss that is waiting for whoever's going to make their way through the loser bracket. Those plays, that's the type of plays of putting your team on your back, making sure that you are the guy making that play in the clutch moment. That's exactly what that, you know, you're looking at that flash to Leah shove right on to Jackie Love. That stuff, that is series winning MVP level stuff from Knight. Main other notes to take from this series is number one, of course, TES is right there with BLG at the top of the LPL table. And I'm honestly rooting for them against JDG because this would be such an exciting team to watch at MSI. Two incredibly polarizing Draven games out of Jackie Love. Unable to do anything in that first game and then gets like five kills early. This is pre-buff Draven for that MSI patch. So that Jackie Love on Draven alone is reason enough for me to want to see this team at MSI. The best Draven one trick we've had in the LPL. Your boy Jackie Love getting a chance to play it. Yes, first time, didn't really get a chance to play it. We're not even gonna include that one in this one because there was no opportunity. Look at that game one draft and you tell me on the side of BLG, which one of these champions just isn't designed for going zero to 100 onto the ADC because all of them were designed for that and every single one of them found that execution on executing the ADC in that first game. But that's next game, 
the Jackie Love gets Draven, you do see that pop up, you see that skill, that type of threat. And I think really when you're talking about the Dravens and around the world, sure, there's a couple other guys that can pop up and teams that can implement it into them. Nobody takes it to the extremes and gets as much out of it the way that Jackie Love can. And we obviously all the praise and highlights uh, for Knight in game five in particular, but really the whole series, he was play playing at a pretty high level, but doesn't mean we can't shout out the continued playoff growth and kind of arrival statement from Cream. He picked up MVP in that fourth game that got TES over the hump to force that game five. Going toe to toe with Knight, he held his own most of this series. This was one of the most uh, major question marks heading into the year for top esports when you looked at it. Of course, a lot of people instantly, you're getting the thumbs up for the 369 move. You might have had a little bit of questions whether Tian can still operate at this type of level, still perform for a team that is competing at the ultra end of the LPL. You had a little bit about the bot lane, and of course, Cream in the mid lane. If he was not going to rise up, if he was not going to continue to improve and go on the trajectory upwards of the LPL mid laners, this team wouldn't find a way to be one of the elite squads of the LPL. He has had that growth. He has been here. It's not always been super pretty. That, that, that certainly is fair, but he has had his growth. He's had his good moments. He's had his cr clutch and crucial moments for this team as well, where he has been a vital part of what's going right. I do think it's important to give him that shout out, even if uh, a couple of mistakes in this series and a, cost, a cost, costly bit of greed in that late game five, I'll say as well, is one of the downfalls of top esports. And finally, these were clearly the two best bot lanes throughout the entire regular season in the LPL, but in the three wins that BLG did have on just an absolute animal in that bot lane. Doesn't matter if it was the laning phase or running around the map, have an impact. The Camille, Renata Glask, and then the Rakan in game five. This guy, this is maybe the best series or best split that we've seen in his career. And it's, it's outstanding that we're coming away and talking about this because of course, number one, you look at that bottom lane and probably the first thing that you want to be talking about is the Callista performance that was going on, that Ooh. lethality Callista, because that Actually damage doing... was... Whoa, that damage was out of this world. I had to what pause the video on. multiple times and be like, what What just did a thousand? Oh, it's a, it's a QE real quick. Okay. okay. Oh, oh, there was only two or three spears in there. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, let's get that damage way out there. But of course, other than that, it really is the story of the bot lane duo is about on and what he was doing right in this series and the role that he had to play. I think this is one of those ones where we talk all about the bottom lanes in the LPL and of course about the supports. And I think a player like on kind of got a little bit lost in the shuffle of what was happening this split. But to get this type of performance, this one absolutely grabs your attention and your respect. No question, Bin and Knight playing at this level makes for a terrifying prospect and matchup for any team at MSI, especially because they're going to have some home court advantage here in 2024. Yeah, you better believe that they're going to have that home court, or home court advantage. Everyone's going to be cheering for it. It's going to be a great event, this MSI. And you better believe, though, that if depending on who it's going to be, any of these, you know, trio from the LPL still, uh, you know, the other two who is going to join BLG for that MSI uh, event, you know that we're going to be sending some other squads and we're going to have a chance to talk about them with the finals of the LCK and LEC coming up shortly. The, the final spot in that Korea matchup. We've got the rematch. It was a swift 3-0 in the earlier rounds of the playoffs. T1 versus Hanwha Life, the showdown for an opportunity to meet up with Gen G in these finals. And I know we talked about T1 completely turned around, looked like a new squad when they matched up against D+. Following that Hanwha loss, they're back to a more regular and regimented practice schedule are the boys. So feeling better about them heading into this Hanwha life matchup than we did beforehand. But no question, hands down, the matchup to look for here is Zeus versus Doran because Mark when you look at it historically we're going all the way back to 2022 summer it's a 16 to 6 win category in the favor of Zay or of Doran excuse me Doran has dominated 
this matchup. It's three titles for Doran, zero for Zeus. These are playoff matches only. And you look at the KDA as well. Doran is almost three times as high. He has owned this matchup in the most important matchups for almost three years. It's it's crazy. And I'll need someone with maybe more of a monster verse type of knowledge to fill us in on this one. What What is the relative? What is a, a, a step off, a spin off? of the boogeyman of baba yaga because that has got to be what doran represents and then the rest of gen g as well as that boogeyman for t1 in the lck maybe it's just specifically for zeus because nobody else pretty much would ever even come close more or less to a 50 percent win rate against your boy zeus you're talking about that 16 to 6 head to head in playoffs for Doran, yes, Doran has been Zeus's daddy up in the top side. He has been the T1 daddy, making sure that he is that thorn in their side. He is that disruptor to everything that wants to go down for T1. And he was a mega monster in that 3-0 earlier in these playoffs for Hanwha Life. Yes, there is some help. There is a sprinkling. There's an asterisk alongside it. What is going on with Peanut? in the jungle whatever he's happy whatever tension's going on if he's on his game if he's got a plan that's a problem because he's going to help accelerate and get doran to where he needs to be to be that disruptor to be that threat to be that denier to t1 and to zeus to that path to that lck finals this series, man, you better believe i'm hyped for hanwha life versus t1 the rematch and listen peanut was playing out of his mind in this last series he was exactly where he needed to be pretty much throughout all three games and was one of the main reasons why it led to be in a sweep but that Zeus Doran matchup you look historically I feel like confidence is the biggest thing to talk about with Zeus because when he's picking Yone and Jace he's just a one-man highlight reel to go through some of these games but you look at these matchups against Doran more often than not, it feels like he's pulling back. All of a sudden, he's playing Orn. He's playing Scion. It feels like he doesn't have the confidence against this dude to pop off. And it's one of those situations as well. You can think back to multiple times against Doran, where Doran maybe will take something a little bit more tanky or something that's not necessarily as flashy. And Zeus goes for the flashy option, and he isn't able to generate the advantages that the flashy option needs to accelerate, to operate on the professional stage compared to, say, a solo queue environment type of thing. That's something that you think I think you see, and you, that's why you see Doran have the effect later on in a lot of these matchups and find a way to get his team blowing up the Nexus at the end of the day. That is going to be an absolutely crucial matchup individually. And as you mentioned, Peanut was playing outside of his mind the last time these two met up. So it's going to be all about what he's got going on and what owner is having in this series as well. I think those two, that top is the majority of it. And then you slap in the jungle just alongside it in this series is going to be where the main focus, main attention has got to be. Other angle to look at here, despite losing that matchup to Gen G, I don't think anyone in the right mind would be saying pays outperformed Viper in that series because Viper was absolutely deadly across every single game. So you need a level up back to regular season form for both Guma and Kyria in that 2v2. You need to also not let the light play Nautilus apparently because that was a mega problem as well in that other series when we identify what was going on, what went wrong and what led to the loss for T1. That Nautilus delight, how he was able to play it. We call I called him cosplay Nautilus because there's no way you're looking as bulky like that, wearing real metal armor, going around the map like yeah, that. It's, it's all styrofoam, that. man. Yeah, hundred percent. There's <laughs> no way. I'm not getting fooled by it. I've seen it. Yes, you can't let him cosplay the Nautilus out there, making sure that he's disrupting everything on your team. This has got to be a big one where Guma and Kiria as well do step up, do provide that other angle for a T1. Take away the attention from that top side matchup and maybe make it an opportunity for Zayz to get that 1v1 step up. Is T1 getting the revenge or is this a full Gen G finals that we're looking at? I can't give you an unbiased answer at the end of the day for this one, but I can tell you unbiased Silver Scrapes. Give us the five games in this one. I think this one goes the distance. I think you get enough firepower from T1 and you do of course get that pushback from Hanwha Life that we are going the distance, boys. Buckle up. It ain't just the LPL that can do game five. And listen, you can never discount 
the T1 playoff plot armor. Going back a couple of splits. It doesn't mean they're going to win, but they're at least getting that guaranteed finals matchup against Gen G. And truthfully, I think either of these teams have a shot against Gen G in their current form. We've already mentioned Pays hasn't had a great playoff run so far. I know Chobi's arguably having his best split of an illustrious career, but it feels like if Chobi isn't dragging this team over the finish line, they're more vulnerable than they've been in the last couple of finals. Yeah, outside of, you know, maybe the occasional keen performance where he really takes over in the top side, he has still shown that that is capable in this LCK, that he's still got that in, at this point of his career. But you are right, the evaluation so far in playoffs has been that that bottom lane is not necessarily operating at a 10 out of 10 and 11 out of 10. It might be at a, that, you know, 7.5, 8.5 out of 10 type of territory to be a top level team, to stay in the elite, to strand, to stay floating in that water. You got to make sure you're operating at a high level. And that ain't high enough for Gen G when you're looking at what is capable on the Hanwha life and T1 side ahead of them. I don't think anybody is safe so far in this LCK. Yes, Gen G's locked up that final spot. But I think it is still an open race for who's going to take that number one seed to MSI. LEC, we also going to see who gets that other MSI spot over the weekend. G2 already locked up a spot. They've had a spot locked up for like a month and a half. They're sitting pretty in the finals. But Team BDS and Fnatic splits on the line. International recognition on the line. Both... I mean, you could talk about different levels of confidence. BDS looked like they got a little spun around and dizzy from the lane swaps from G2. And Fnatic just played the messiest, bloodiest series in the history of the LEC. So neither coming in with the cleanest uh, of matchups coming into these finals. So, so uh, you can kind of take it a couple of ways. And mine for Fnatic, number one, is going to be that, yes, you did have this incredibly messy series. There was a lot of positives in there. A lot of negatives. So I think there's been a lot to review. And a lot of that review has also been, you know, kind of about that balance. It's been about taking this is good. This is right. You know, all these things. Sure. And reinforcing that. And then going, this was bad. This was not right. These were not the right calls. This was not the right execution. All these type of things. And working on that heading into the preparation for this next week. So you can look at that on the side of Fnatic and realize, yes, they're going to have a chance to look at what they did right everything good there and they're going to get that opportunity to look at the bad and really reflect on it and move forward positively on it on the side of bds that run around from g2 you're still going to be confused at that point but you got to find a way to separate it and say okay screw g2 they don't exist for our next matchup the only team that matters is fanatic and zero in on that one and get that focus back and get that hunger for that next uh series that could be the ticket for BDS. But you best believe both of these teams have got to be desperate to get that last spot at MSI for L the LEC because, you know, G2 is already there. You don't want to keep falling behind that leader of the pack for the region. And right now, both of these teams can gain so much from that experience and from that trip to go into MSI. And for me in this matchup, the most exciting interesting compelling one has got to be the 80 carries because i'm i'm not really even taking arguments these are the two best in noah and ice that we've seen in the spring split and this is where the firepower is all gonna be in this series yes i know you can talk all about adam and the champions that he likes to play and what goes on there and you can even you know uh, stop around but it is about these two the adcs that you mentioned i think number one Again, another one for ICE where you do tip your cap and say, yep, was wrong about you in the offseason, Masur. Good job. You've been doing fantastic to be at this type of point. This is the series that you want to be talking about because this is going to see the best firepower from the LEC bottom line. And how about, of course, the two Korean import 80 carries are pretty much the only ones who can make the <laughs> Lucian Nami look good in the bot lane. You know what? I'll 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 let them have it. They've got that technology able to get it down for the Lucian Nami times. That is going to be a priority duo for sure in this series. Still, that is one of those things that has remained throughout all these patches that we have seen come through. That duo, I expect to see it through pick and pick. I wanted to lean slightly to Fnatic just because it feels like even it doesn't matter how messy the games are, 
they somehow come away with a win in playoffs and then I'm hearing Irrelevant say that Fnatic is the best team in scrims. I know you hear the scrim word and you want to cover your ears and run away, but that's enough for me to lean towards Fnatic, especially because I haven't had the utmost confidence in BDS throughout this playoff run. I'm telling you where my uh, my loyalty will lie in this one. It's got to go to your boy, Razork in the jungle. I'm telling you right now, nobody has shown me the difference making that he has been able to bring so far this split for the LEC. I think that that's going to extend into this round of the playoffs against BDS. He is going to be the reason why someone like Jun is able to get ahead, get those advantages, get that firepower popping off for the Fnatic side. Now, it feels a bit like Groundhog Day because every time I feel like we're sitting here and I'm saying, okay, whoever wins, do they have a chance against G2? And then we sit here and say, no, probably not. And then G2's winning again. But do either of these squads have a better chance? I mean, I feel like the easy answer is Fnatic because they've taken games off of G2, even though they got smashed in their last playoff matchup. But we just saw a BDS against G2 and they seemed to clear cut below. Yeah, and I think at some point, at the very least, you do give BDS some of the credit for the advantages. They were able to find a, a sprinkling of them in that series. Obviously, not able to really convert any of them against G2 is the counterpoint that comes across. And yes, Fnatic has been able to at least convert a couple of these times. They do get competitive, do get the advantages on G2. There just hasn't been too many of them is the other side of that coin when you flip it over and you realize what you're looking at and that is most likely again another one where we talk a little bit about these other squads and then end up yeah but a g2 is just uh, you cannot top g2 right now in the lec and what they offer i think when you're talking about players like caps what the meta is uh for the top lane as well and where you can experiment for someone like broken blade and growth that he has shown as an individual player the, uh, that option, just to me, is leading straight down to another G2 championship. Especially when you're talking about Caps. Maybe having the best, one of the best splits of his career now that he's so deep into his career. This guy truly runs the EU region. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thank you for hanging out with us as always. And you best believe we'll catch you on that flippity flip.